The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This is your captain speaking. We are beginning our descent into madness. <laughs> We are back to another edition of West of the Rockies. I'm Frank. Thank you guys for sticking around. I know it's late, but boy, in a tradition of great shows, this uh, definitely is going to make the list, uh, if I may say so myself. Genevieve, how are you doing over there? I'm doing quite all right. All the way over here, how are you? <laughs> all the way over there, all the way across the desk. I'm doing great. I'm really excited, as you can tell probably by the tone of my voice. Um, yes. I'm when really excited. When you start excited. stumbling, of course you're excited. <laughs> Every time I just trip over my own words, you know it's going to be a good show. No, but seriously, thank you folks for tuning in. If you're catching the podcast version of this show, hello to you, sir and or madam. I hope future. everything <laughs> is uh, going well. Yeah. Like I said, tonight I'm really excited. We have an amazing guest and uh, I'm literally a, a bit at a loss for words because at a young age, his book, Communion, really cracked my head open to the possibilities of what is out there, if I may use the term out there. To many a sleepless night, as far as I know. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. I mean, we're talking about this off air that literally, and even now, I mean, even I'm, now, I'm, yes, I'm yes. in my <clears throat> 20s. We'll say 20s. Yes, 20s plus a bit. <laughs> 20s plus a bit. <laughs> Even to this day, every time I pick up that book uh, and I picked it up to just kind of, you know, refresh my memory a bit on it. There is something about that book cover that, as I told you, you know, when I was in my teens reading that book, every time I, I, I put it down for the night, I would have to put it with the back cover up because there was something very uneasy about that. And I want to talk to him about that and about a whole other host of things that, that we got lined up. Because honestly, you know what? I'm going to shut my trap right now because I want to let Genevieve do the introduction for our guest tonight. And then we're going to get him on the line and talk about some of this stuff. So Genevieve, if you would do us the honor, can you please introduce tonight's guest? Whitley Strieber, born June 13, 1945, in San Antonio, Texas, is a professional writer, best known for his horror novels, The Wolf and the Hunger, and his exciting new Alien Hunter series, as well as for the international bestseller, of course, Communion, a non-fiction account of his experiences with non-human entities. Now a go-to book for all ufologists out there. He received a BA from the University of Texas back in 68 and a certificate from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has maintained a dual career of author of fiction and advocate of alternative concepts through his best-selling non-fiction books, his Unknown Country website and his internet podcast Dreamland, which for those interested is available on a weekly basis via the aforementioned website Unknown Country. That's unknowncountry.com. Many of his novels have been made into movies, including Communion, of course, The Wolf and the Hunger, and Superstorm, known in movie form as The Day After Tomorrow. His 2006 novel, The Greys, is currently on its way to being turned into a movie as well. Alien Hunter, on the other hand, has just recently been made into a TV series by the Sci-Fi Channel. It's called Hunters and shall start airing April the 11th of this year. Whitley's latest book, released just in February of this year, is called Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained. And just to be clear to all listeners, that's super and natural spelt as two separate words. This book, amongst a few other things, shall be the focus of much of our talk today. This book, written alongside Professor Jeffrey Kripal, redefines the meaning of the close encounter and UFO phenomena and has been called the most important book on the paranormal in 40 years by author Gary Jensen. And with that, I have the absolute honor of introducing Whitley Strieber onto West of the Rockies. Uh, Mr. Strieber, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time for being with us tonight. Uh, as I mentioned at the uh, at the opening of the show, uh, we're really excited to have you on and, and discuss some of these topics because I feel you are one of the few people that has a, a very unique insight into this strange phenomenon that, that seems to be happening to people all around the world. Now, before we get too deep into things, for the folks that, you know, may not be too familiar with your story, can you tell us a little bit 
about your experiences as they happened in the winter of 1985 that you uh, told in your book, Communion, where you had this uh, uh, visitations by these strange um, entities. Yeah, I was, I woke up um, in the middle of the night of December the 26th, 27th, 1985, and something was wrong. I was in motion. And the next thing I knew, I kept trying to fully wake up and I couldn't. Uh, I I wasn't in my bed, and and finally I became conscious enough to find myself in a chaotic situation in a small room with these uh, two different sorts of creature around me, struggling with me. I was trying to fight them off in my sleep, and um, there was a a female voice that sounded rather robotic saying, uh, what can we do to help you stop screaming over and over again? And um, it went on from there. There was a, it was a pretty violent experience. And I guess uh woke up the next morning quite disturbed and confused because obviously something had gone wrong during the night. And I finally decided that there was an, I had been an owl in the house. Yeah, and of course it was a cabin that was completely enclosed in upstate New York in the s- snows of winter, so no owl. N- there was no chimney. It didn't have a fireplace, so nothing had come in. And finally, s- toward the end of the day, I thought to myself, well, it must have been at the window upstairs. And I went upstairs and looked at the sill, and there was no sign of any disturbance in the snow. And that began a, an odyssey for me because I, couldn't, it wasn't a dream. It was obvious. I was beat up. I had suffered from, uh, I was not in good, good shape and my wife didn't remember anything. Uh, so I, I was really very disturbed. Uh, I went to the doctor a couple of days later and he, he referred me to a neurologist who did an MRI scan and my brain was found to be normal. And, uh, the next place I went to stop was a, uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Donald Klein, who was an expert in forensic hypnosis and thought when he heard the story that I had been the victim of some sort of a crime. But when he placed me under hypnosis, this, instead of becoming a more reasonable sort of criminal event, as I had written a number of controversial books before then, and it was more than possible that someone might have come into the house and drugged me or done something to try to to harm me. These figures coalesced. Not only did they coalesce into aliens, or what looked at those in those times like aliens to me, there was a um, an instant in the session in the narration of it where I regressed to the age of 12. And after we were finished, this was in the second session, the doctor said, uh, very frankly, he said, what are, you're describing is to you is a real experience. And not only that, it, it um, fits the pattern of persistent molestation in that you spontaneously regressed and that's what happens to people who have had something like this occur in their lives more than once. Oh, wow. And where it's been suppressed. And initially, I was very uneasy about the idea of alien contact. In the frontispiece of communion, there is a statement that ends with the phrase, the human mind winks back from the dark. And I'm still not ready to just accept the alien hypothesis as the answer. There's something going on here that's extremely strange. And that's what I found fascinating, because I think that almost by happenstance, you became kind of like a spokesman for alien abductions and extraterrestrials, but you were always very cautious not to put a label on what these entities were. Uh, before we talked about the, the entities further, one of the things that I like, uh, if I may use the term like, about your case is that 
As you just mentioned, you have some um, medical evidence to back up what happened to you, but also there were witnesses to, to some of these experiences, correct? Can you tell me just uh, briefly what some of these witnesses saw while they were in your cabin? Well, uh, the first witness uh, was a friend. It didn't happen in the cabin. It's not something I've written about, but I may have mentioned it more recently, but uh, he was a retired state trooper, New York State trooper, and he saw something in a field that looked like to him like a dirigible, a good deer blimp, or I mean, in a field about two o'clock in the morning when he was coming home from a party with his wife, and he stopped to to go investigate because, you know, he's a former member of the state police, and it was obvious that whatever was there shouldn't be there at that hour. Uh, if it was a Blimp, it was, it was down. Something was wrong. As he walked toward it, he heard someone screaming inside of it. And then suddenly it turned on lights all over it and made a growling noise and came sweeping across the field toward him. In the car behind him, his wife panicked and he ran back to the car and got in and drove away because it was obvious that whatever it was, it wasn't under in any duress. And, um, he told me, said nothing about it. I mean, he had no, no reason to say anything to me. And, uh, however, about a year later after I published Communion and he read the book, he came forward and told me that story. Wow. Now I'll fast forward to the cabin. My wife, Anne, who sadly enough passed away, played an enormous role in all of this. She didn't have experiences of her own. But what she did do was to organize things and, and above all, to add insight and understanding at a very high level. She was an extremely brilliant person. And we began to get letters from people after communion was published, letters by the thousands and then tens of thousands on a weekly basis. And Anne had a unique ability to take letters and she would say, we need to call, get so-and-so to come up to the cabin and so-and-so. And the first time we did that, we had a magazine editor who had promised to publish a story about it if he encountered the visitors in the cabin and some friends, but we didn't have people who we had chosen from the letters. Upstairs, there were four people sleeping in the living room. When I say sleeping, I don't think anyone but Ann and I ever slept in that cabin. And uh, down in the basement, there was in a little basement bedroom, there was a couple uh, who were married or not married, but they were together. So mm -hmm. they had the private space. Here's what happened. Into the living room, there came in the middle of the night, small, dark blue creatures like uh, there was one of the types I'd seen in the in the machine. And they began jumping around in the living room. And the people in the room could talk to each other. They could talk about what was happening, but they could not move. None of them, they were paralyzed. They were unable to move. So they were having these things jumping around in the room and unable to move. Meanwhile, in the basement, and this is where this de deviates from the usual so-called alien hypothesis, the people in the bed in the basement woke up to see a friend of theirs standing at the foot of the bed. She had died in an earthquake three years prior and was now the second dead person we had seen in connection with this. On the night of my experience, I remembered seeing a dead friend in the context of these supposed aliens as well. And then in the letters, Anne began to see more and more letters that where people would have encounters with the supposed aliens and also with dead friends and relatives. And she said to me, Whitney, this has got something to do with what we call death, but it's not death. We don't understand what it is. And also, I don't think we understand what these beings are. And that's sort of where we were then. And that's one of the cabin experiences. There were others. Mrs. Streber, since you just mentioned Anne, um, from everything I've 
I've read um, and you know listened to so far in interviews i i truly get the sense at least to the extent that we know the term um that you found your soulmate in Anne, and i've also heard you talk about how you know she's still with you even after her physical death could you tell us uh, at least briefly about this experience thus far yeah uh and died last august 11th and before Anne died she was not afraid. She'd had a near-death experience in 2004, and people who have those experiences are generally not very afraid of death, and she was no exception. Mm -hmm. During her NDE, something happened that I've always felt was very important for anyone who hears it to remember, and I'll repeat it now. She found herself in a space like a kind of train station or subway station, and there were benches. People sitting on the benches, and they're all holding big bags of stuff, suitcases and whatnot. And she realized when she was there that they could not move ahead unless they dropped those bags, which consisted of desires, unfulfilled desires, regrets, uh, et cetera, and so forth from this life. And it's a big lesson. It's a great life lesson that it's important to drop those things. After Anne passed away, the first thing that happened was about an hour after she died, I was just bereft. Here was my my soulmate, that's correct, of 45 years, yeah. gone. And I had just, just, it was so hard, unbelievably hard. And suddenly the, I was thinking, Annie, do you still exist? Where are you? And they had just taken our body away. And for the first time in 45 years, I would not be sleeping beside my wife. And... Yeah. Suddenly the phone rang, and it was a friend. And she said, Whitley, I had the funniest feeling. She knew Anne was ill, of course, that I needed to call you right away. And is Anne all right? And I, she said, because she, I feel like she wants me to call you and tell you she's right with you. And I said, Belle, Anne died an hour ago. Yeah. And that was the first incident. The second incident happened about five days later. I was in the mountains east of uh, Los Angeles with my family, and I was sitting alone on a bench, just quietly, and thinking about Anne, and thinking, you know, do you still exist? I was still having that thought, and my cell phone rang, and I picked it up, and it was a friend from Nashville who said exactly the same thing. She said, Whitley, I just had the funniest feeling that I should call you. I felt like Anne was telling me to call you and tell you that she's here. She's right with you. Wow. And that was, those were only the first two of what have become dozens and dozens of incidents. And, uh, I've broadcast about them on my, on Dreamland, on my show on Unknown Country, and also in the, uh, a smaller show that I do myself just with my own voice for the most part called Awakening which is sort of the theme of Dreamland. It's about waking up to a bigger world. And Anne's role is that Anne was always a teacher in her life. She was a wonderful teacher of, at every level. And frankly, I think she still is. I do think she still exists, and I think she's very much with us. Mr. Schreiber, one of the one of the things that I I found fascinating in the last few years was uh, reading up on shamanic and mystical experiences and and what some of these shamans experience and go through. I almost wonder if you had been around, you know, uh, years back in a different part of the world, would you be considered a shaman? Because a lot of your experiences are very uh, similar with what some of these uh, individuals report, including seeing deceased uh, loved ones or, or friends. To you, who has been submerged in this world, what does that tell you? Is this the idea of heaven that sometimes uh, we learn through religion, that we'll see our loved ones on the other side? Or is there something more or something that we can't even uh, explain just yet? Well, what I think is that this universe is very, very old and very, very large and very complex. And we are a very small little species on a speck of Earth out in the middle of nowhere, 
and we're quite new, and we have limited abilities to see and understand. We're limited by our senses and by our brain. And we have no idea what really is going on here. We don't know the aim of the universe. We don't know how it began. We don't know much about most of it. We just know it's there because most of it is too far away for us to really see in any detail at all. So it, when you think of how many people there are or how many grains of sand there are on the earth, the extraordinary thing is that there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on earth. And uh, that's brain bending. So, of course, there's a lot happening. As far as shamanism is concerned, I am living in two worlds. I live in this world, and I live in the world of what we call the dead, and they're not it's not the world of the dead. We just call it that. And uh, that's what shamans do. They live in, they have one foot in one world and one foot in the other world, and so I suppose I do. But the difference is this. I am not bringing, I don't think that other world is all knowing. I don't think that at all. I think that it is outside of time looking in. And it sees more. They see more from that viewpoint. But I don't think that the future is foreordained. I think they can't see much more of the future than we can. They have greater insight is all. So uh, I'm, I'm not like a shaman who might uh, go into the dream world or the, uh, out to the other world and come back with careful instructions about what will happen in the future, which generally do not turn out to be true. But I am like a shaman in the sense that I can penetrate into that world and see and function in that world to some extent. Uh, and, you know, Annie was very interested in building a bridge between the worlds. Uh, in fact, this week's Dreamland is about that very subject of building that bridge. And uh, she she felt that we should work on both sides to build a bridge between us. And that's what I do now. It's, I, I work, uh, my primary methodology is the use of meditation, certain type of meditation, and I meditate, oh, a lot, at least an hour or more, sometimes more like an hour and a half a day. I meditate at 11 o'clock at night until about 11.45 or 12, then I get up again at 3 in the morning and I meditate again. And then I usually meditate again in the early, very early morning just as I'm waking up and, and getting ready to start my day. Uh, and I do that so much because it seems to focus for Anne. And I, I was at a conference of, uh, of some kind a few few months ago, about six months ago, and a woman walk, walked up to me and said, Mr. Streeper, I have something I want to tell you, and it's a little strange. And I said, well, you know, you're talking to the right guy. <laughs> I'm, I'm all about a little strange. In fact, a lot strange is fine, too. And she said, I just heard from your wife. I and no, from Adam. And I said, really? She said, yes, it was just as clear as a bell. She was talking to me in my ear. And then she said, do you have some sort of a chair, a special chair? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I have my chair in our living room. And I thought to myself, that's my, where I meditate. And the woman said, Anne said to tell you that she can see you when you're in the chair. And that was very revelatory because I knew immediately that it, why this whole meditation thing was so important. That's when they can see us. When the, they can see us in our world when we are in that meditative state and, and interact with us. And that's what she wanted me to know. And that's why I start meditating so much. Because I'm, I'm encountering, I'm with not only Anne, but there's lots, there's a whole vast, unimaginably vast world, much bigger than this one, in that other level of reality. I find it really interesting how 
you know, on several occasions, you've spoken about this essentially a symbiotic relationship between this other force, this other energy, whatever it may be. It's as if, you know, we need to be thinking about it or at least having some sort of connected thoughts while they or it is having the equivalent thoughts of us. Um, so yeah, I find it very interesting that it, it doesn't seem to just be a one-way relationship, but humans, if they do want whatever you want to call it, contact, communion, you know, they, they need to play their part and focus their minds just as much. I would think so, yeah. I think it it takes an effort in both directions, on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting when you talk about meditation as being kind of like uh, opening the lines of communication, if you will, because it's it's not the first time that I hear about it. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've tried it a, a, a few times and I think I've only had moderate success on, on a couple of occasions, both times to, to my uh, shock and surprise, I guess you can say. But I know that you really um, or, or you have made uh, uh, efforts to not really align yourself with any type of religious belief. But what would that tell us about, you know, some of the, the religious disciplines that encourage meditation? Do you think that they are onto something? Do you believe that maybe they have part of the truth in their doctrine and that is a, a practice that more people maybe should try? I don't think that the religious aspect of it matters very much. And as far as your what you said about your own meditation process, um, don't look or you won't see. If you look, you push it away. Uh, that happens to everybody, and I'll tell you why. There is a field, the human body has an electric field uh, elect uh, around it and in it, and it exists a, f a few, just a short distance above the surface of the skin as well, outside of the body. That's why when you get an EEG or an EKG, they can pick up electrical signals because they, they're picking up that field. And that field, when you meditate and you stop thinking and you let your attention go onto your physical body, onto your sensation, it goes into superposition. And that means it essentially becomes part of the universe, not just part of you. And when that happens, it's when these little, little shocks of recognition or or experiences come and we immediately look toward them. When you look toward them, they go back into, you go, it goes, focuses back into, into position. It's no longer in superposition and the vision disappears. You have to learn and it takes a long time. I've been meditating now for over 50 years. Uh, it takes a long time to, to learn to let it be, let it happen. Don't try to do anything. Simply set yourself up in the meditative state. And let your mind go quiet, and it will stay quiet for a few seconds. Then it's going to get start talking again. Then you go back to your body. You take your sensation, your attention back to your sensation of your body. Your mind will go quiet, and you go back and forth like that for 10 or 15 minutes, and it helps. It's a slow process. Your mind will never stay quiet for very long, but the energy is gained in the effort to quiet your mind, not in the quietness itself. Nothing in this is ever lost. Nothing wow. that you do in this. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I will definitely take that into account. Um, because my attempts, I guess, to gain a greater understanding of the, of the world that we live in, um, you know, I, I've tried meditation, and, you know, I've had some interesting results, as I mentioned, that were a bit frightening at the time. One of the things that I experienced, without going into too much detail, because I want to talk about your experiences and, and what you have uh, understood through them, is uh, astral travel. It sounds, uh, you know, reading, uh, especially your, your latest book, uh, The Supernatural, there is a, an interesting... Uh, a story that you tell there about flying through your um, cabin and being going to your son's room where he's having a sleepover, and the next day um, your son's friend uh, apparently claims to have seen a, an alien being. You, you got two stories mixed up there, but thank you for re actually reading them. But most most people don't. Oh. <laughs> Let me tell you the first story, which is the first part of the one you were talking about. Okay. Um, 
it, what happened was this. Uh, I, I do move out of my body, and I don't talk about the details of what I see very much, but suffice to say that on this level, the people, and the, what's on, still on our level and the, where we're, we are, the physical, mostly not, they're people who couldn't, couldn't ascend and, uh, they're not generally the, the people you'd like to meet on, you know, you, they're not good people. Wow. Okay. Uh, the ones who, when someone comes down to this level from above, from a, from a more, and when I say it, I don't think of it as being like, this level is here on the, you know, on the surface and the next level is like in the stratosphere or something. It's okay. not like that. The levels are vibratory. In other words, something that is vibrating just at the edge of this reality is very dense in comparison to something that might be right here and vibrating much more quickly. Uh, and it, that's, it means it's at a different level. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. But anyway, uh, I do that some and, uh, usually try to get off this level and into other levels where I can gather information. Now, going back to the particular experience you started, the first half of it that you mentioned, mm -hmm. it happened in, in uh, a cabin in upstate New York. I woke up, and instead of being out of my body, my body was out of me. In other words, I was in the bed, but there was no there there. There was no Whitley. I was just, my consciousness was there, but I had no body. And I thought, holy moly, now what am I going to do? This is, you know, I've had out-of-body experiences, but now I've never had my body leave me behind. And I, I tried to move out of the room in order to find, but it was frankly terrifying. I, you know, what, what, what in the world? This was not something you'd ever read about in a book, right? Of course, of course. So I, when I tried to move, I was drawn downward, and I was drawn into the boys' bedroom, which was downstairs. And there my body stood. The boys were both awake, and Andrew and his friend was having a sleepover. This was in the cabin. And uh, they were uh, looking up at me, and I was talking to the little boy, to the, to the friend. And then I was in my body, and I had no idea what had been going on, what had been said, any reason. I had no understanding of why I was there. And so I said, well, good night, boys, and went back upstairs, and I sat on the side of the bed for a long time thinking, I, am I not in control here? What in the world? I felt, you know, I felt like somebody else was was running my body or could if they wanted to. It was extremely disturbing and weird. And I finally, I, I went downstairs, I had a drink and came back up, and then I finally fell asleep. I mean, I didn't have a liquor, liquor drink. I, mean, I had a drink of water in, in the, in the kitchen. Finally fell asleep and, uh, woke up in the morning and I told Anne about it because at this point in our life, when these things were happening thick and fast, I always told her everything as soon as I could, as soon as it happened. We had a, a, a pact about that, that I would leave nothing out. I would tell her everything. And so I told her the story as we were getting dressed and we went downstairs. I was really wondering, you know, what would, was it a dream or a nightmare or what the hell was it? I didn't think it could have been anything else, frankly, and neither did she. We were just laughing about it actually being a spectacularly weird nightmare. And the boy's bedroom door bursts open and they both come running out yelling, Whitley came down through the ceiling in the middle of the night. And, uh, we were just flabbergasted. Dan was laughing her head off. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I was, my jaw just dropped. And so then I said, I asked them, well, what happened? And they said, well, they heard this crackling noise and I came down through the ceiling. They saw my physical body. Can you believe that? Coming. And then I said, did what happened? I don't remember this very much. What happened next? And they said, well, we talked. I said, what did we say? And they couldn't remember a thing. Wow. And I said, finally, I said, well, he said, the little friend said, well, in a little while, you said goodnight. And I said, well, what did I say before that? He said, you don't remember? I said, I don't remember. Do you? He said, no, I don't. So 
we left it at that. Then it was time to take him home. We were in upstate New York, uh, in uh, near Woodstock, and which is sort of more downstate to a real upstater. But anyway, 90 miles north of the city, approximately. And they lived, this boy's family summer house was in the Delaware Water Gap, which was about 70 or 80 miles south of us. So the two boys would trade time at each other's summer homes. And I took this little boy down to our meeting place in Paramus, New Jersey. There's a diner there. It's a Route 17, a big divided highway, not an interstate. And uh, I, I could see his father's truck there in the in the in the uh, parking lot of the diner. And I was going south, and I had to go over an overpass and come north a bit to get to the diner. And I know the father could see us. He, he, he was sitting right there looking right at the car. So we go off the highway, and instead of going into the overpass, which was right there, I mean, it was visible, I went right toward it. To my amazement, I found myself going down into another entirely different highway that I'd never seen before. And I said to the boy, I think I made a wrong turn. And he was just sitting there silent. And so I saw an exit ahead, and I come up, came up out of the exit. And there, I saw something pass us that was strange. It didn't look like a normal car. And I got off the exit anyway, and I was in this bizarre neighborhood. First, it had been cloudy in Paramus. Now there was, there were trees overhanging the streets, and sunlight dappling down through the trees it was clearly now a clear day. But the thing that was the most concerning was, set back from the from the uh, street on lawns, there were these low kind of sandstone buildings with with bas relief on them of snakes, of serpents, and low arched doorways closed by wooden doors, and they all looked more or less the same. And it was flabbergasting. I mean, then the little boy panics and starts trying to get out of, jump out of the car. And so I'm pushing down the automatic lock. He's pulling it up. I'm wow. pushing it down. And I'm trying like hell to find out how to, how do we get out of this? What in the world has happened here? I'm just horrified. I've got this other man's child in my car, and I'm I'm in the damn twilight zone. I don't even know. I have no idea. I've never seen anything like this neighborhood in Paramus or anywhere else. I'm driving almost at random. In fact, I am driving at random. Then I see a street, and at the end of the street, there's some sunlight, open sunlight. And I drive out there onto... Uh, what was like a un, just sort of a rough area where there was no development. And as I drive it, it gets cloudy again, and I get to a shoulder of a road. And we get and it's a normal highway. It's even fairly familiar. I'm not sure which one it is, but it's one I've been on before. So I get on it and I start driving. It turns out to be Route 80, which was about 20 miles south of where we took the underpass. And it's only been a few minutes. It's it just incredible. So I get back on the on on Route 17, and I'm going back. By this time, the dad has seen us turn, and he knew that we were right there, and then we never reappeared. So he's in his pickup truck, standing in the bed of his pickup, looking for us. All this time, the little boy has said nothing, and he stopped trying to get out of the car, though. And the father is super skeptical. He's about the community experience, he's telling my son and his son, don't believe Whitley, he's completely, this is not possible, it can't happen. And so I'm sort of hoping the little boy will just keep his mouth shut about what just did happen. This is a fairly fantastic thing. I pull in, and he jumps out of the car, runs across the parking lot to his dad, yelling, Daddy, Daddy, Whitley just took me on a ride through the Twilight Zone. Oh, boy. <laughs> now, you figure that out. Wow. I can't. Wow. There we have it. Wow. You know, I stopped connecting dots a long time ago. <laughs> I didn't even bother to talk about parallel universes, parallel mm -hmm. realities, any of that. I have no idea how to explain the story I just told you. 
Wow. Yeah. You know, just a few minutes ago, we were talking about your new book, The Paranormal, um, well, The Supernatural, sorry. And um, I just want to say it's something very similar to what I've been saying for a number of years now, and uh, which is why I love it so much. The way I've always phrased it, and I know this is very different from what is said in the book, but I've never believed in the supernatural or the paranormal per se, just because anything that happens, you know, de facto is natural or normal because it is happening or has happened. So by definition, it's natural or real. So that's why I really like your approach and um, Professor um, Kripal's approach to your book, but could you tell us a little bit about this very interesting dialectic that's been going on in this uh, new publication of yours and what exactly you're hoping to achieve with that? Yeah, I sure can. Um, but first of all, dialectically speaking, mm-hmm. uh, Jeffrey's idea in the book is to make a cut, to mm-hmm. make a cut between stories like the one I just told you, and conclusions about that story. In other words, I said just a moment ago that I no longer think in terms of what it may have been. I can only describe what happened and not go beyond that. But we have, since from the beginning of our history, somebody sees something strange, a shadowy figure move across a room. That's a ghost. It's not. It's a phenomenon that we cannot explain. That's what it is. The experience I had and described, and most of the experiences of my life, are experiences that we cannot explain. Rather than make the leap, let's make a cut and not do that, and revisit this material as phenomena. One of the things, the mistakes that the skeptical community makes in an effort to not have to visit this phenomenon because it, for some reason, is believed to be unimportant, even though it is core human experience throughout our history, and it's obviously not unimportant. But they want to say it's anecdotal. That is to say, it's a singular experience that can't be repeated. And yet strange experiences like the one I just described, of all different stripes, happen to people every single day all over the world and always have. So what are we looking at? We don't yet know. But I will say one thing for sure. I could not agree with you more. We are looking at something that is part of nature because there is nothing outside of nature looking in. Nothing is peeking in the door of nature. Nature is what is all of it. Yeah, yeah. Ms. Schriebert, we're heading to the top of the hour. So we're going to take a quick break just to do our due diligence and play some station IDs. Could I ask you to just kindly stay on the line while we take care of that? And when and when we come back, I really want to dive into more of your new book, uh, The Supernatural, because it's a very, uh, what's the word, uh, courageous and daring uh, book that you have uh, uh, published. And I want to talk about some of the ideas that you propose in that book and just how that may help us understand this uh, natural, supernatural uh, reality that we live in. And, you know, I I was super surprised when I heard that this book, apparently it's at least, you know, up until the last few months, has not been very well read. And I honestly believe that this will not last long because it seems such a poignant publication in the world of academics, uh, something that really hasn't been approached much at all, that I I truly believe it will be (laughs) very well read in the near future. So, um, yeah, I don't believe that will last long. So, Mr. Schreiber, can we get you just to hang on the line for a few minutes and then we'll come back and and talk some more about this? Great. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break. We want to come back ASAP to continue talking to Mr. Strieber about uh, this and a whole lot more stuff. Let me see. We're going to go out with uh, people that tune into the show probably know that I love Joe Satriani. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of his songs and, and his concept albums. And I'm going to play a track that I find quite fitting of the stuff that we're talking about tonight. And uh, this song is called Light Years Away from his album Black Swans and Wormhole Wizards. Here's a, a little 
Joe Satriani, West of the Rockies, coming right back in just a few minutes. Here we go. West of the Rockies with Frank. Open, open your, your, your mind. And we are back to the second hour of uh, West of the Rockies. I'm Frank. Thank you guys for sticking around. I know it's late, but boy, we're having a really mind-bending time here mm-hmm. tonight. As always, I'm Engineer Frank on Twitter, West of the Rockies on Facebook. Don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at WTR Radio and check out the website, WTRRadio.com, for cool interviews and some other uh, fun stuff to check out. I'm always joined here by Genevieve. You can find her on Twitter. Uh, Genevieve Yue, mm-hmm. and of course, our guest tonight is none other than Mr. Whitley Strieber. His website, Strieber.com, and you can also check out his other website, Unknown Country, uh, and his obviously his weekly uh, podcast, which uh, mm-hmm. it's, uh, d- I mean, if, if you're fascinated uh, by his books, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Mr. Strieber is definitely a, a, has a wealth of information to share, and he does so every week. One of the things that I actually want to ask Mr. Strieber, if, if he'd be so kind to, to enter mm-hmm my questions because I'm sure some of these he's been asked a million times but one of them is the artwork for a communion Mr. Strieber as I mentioned you know when in my in my early teens I, I picked up a, a copy of your book and I, I have my dad to thank for being I don't know if he purposely did it or not but for having his library of books accessible to me at such a young age and that was one of the books that I grabbed and uh, and like I mentioned at the top of the show I there there is something about this portrait you have on communion just those eyes how did you manage to get this 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 uh, depiction of these entities on the cover of your book to be so lifelike, if I may use the term. Well, I had I sat with Ted, Ted Seth Jacobs, an artist who had done police work and was also a very good representational artist and mm-hmm. uh, could, could, in other words, could do realistic portraits. And I had the portrait made, uh, painted to my specifications. We literally, I sat beside it as he painted. And uh, the Eyes may be more prominent than they actually were, but that's how they felt. Wow. They were very powerful. And the sort of smile on the lips was, that was life as far as I can remember. Wow, there it's almost like the Mona Lisa of uh, of, of alien paintings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know when you're with a person like that, you don't think of it as an alien at all. I, I didn't. I, it's more like being with a very strange-looking human being. It, it didn't mm-hmm. feel. I didn't feel a sense of alienness. I did about the little blue fellows. They were really strange-looking, and uh, they were. Uh, that would have convinced me. And yet. The stories of them go all the way back and long. They have a very long history in Europe. The you know so they've been living. They they've been believed to be living underground in Europe uh, for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And indeed, if you go to Bavaria, you find that it's honeycombed with little with tunnels, many of which are so small a human being can't pass through them. Oh, wow. You have to wonder if they really did live there at right. some point. <laughs> well, here's an interesting story. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you get a ton of them, but uh, I would like to share this one with you because I was as I was reading your book and you were talking about these little blue beings. Uh, the kobolds. Uh, yeah, correct. In mm-hmm. German. Um, I can't recall because this happened uh, many years ago. I can't recall if, if I was told of what color they were, but uh, I've traveled to Mexico in a couple of occasions. And uh, and people in Mexico, they they tend to be pretty open about some of their um, more strange experiences, especially if, if the person they find has a, an ear to lend to their stories. And on a couple of occasions, I've heard stories about these little elves. And, and one woman in particular, she told me this story that at night, that there were nights there that she couldn't sleep because she had to protect her young children from these elves that would try to carry them away in the middle of the night. And it echoes some of the experience that you've had with some of these entities. And as you mentioned, 
throughout history, we have heard about this, you know, some of these like elves and, and you see it in some of the old uh, depictions, uh, you know, kind of like standing around almost like dancing in circles and, and things of that nature and kind of appearing out of nowhere. What can we make of this? Are, are the aliens of today the elves from yesterday? Sure they are. They must be. They're the fairy folk and elves and whatnot. Uh, the, um, maybe there's another species of intelligent creature living on this planet or under the surface of it. Uh, the, if they are more intelligent than we are, we're not going to be able to find them unless they want us to. They're going to be in control of the situation. In other words, this might be their world more than it is ours. Wow. We don't know. We have no idea. Uh, but uh, one thing I'm fairly sure of is that for the most part, they're probably not aliens who arrived here recently from another planet or another place. However, it's always said that, oh, well, they could never get here because the distances are too great. Now we're sending a uh, probe at nearly the speed of light to Alpha Centauri. They'll be there in a few years. So. I'm sorry, they can get here. And if they've, if they've been around for millions of years, they've probably been here longer than we have. So the whole idea of aliens kind of gets kind of a little blurry there, doesn't it? You know, it, I, I don't think it's true that aliens have shown up here recently and are sort of landing and looking us over and doing whatnot to us. Um, there's something else going on, and it has very profoundly to do with us. And in order to understand it, we're going to have to start with ourselves. There's no use in starting with these other entities because we're not going to get anywhere that way. It's really interesting that you say that because reading reading your latest book, it, it made me really put in a context how uh, we take our senses as the end all to perceive reality, right? Like we think what we can see with our eyes, that's all there is. What we can hear with our ears, that's all there is. What we can touch, what we can taste, that's all there is. But we don't realize how such a small fraction of the spectrum of senses that really is. And, uh, no. and, and I believe you and I I may be paraphrasing him poorly, and I apologize, but I think you, you, you've said something along the lines of, we're imprisoned in our bodies, so to speak. Yeah, I think we are very much imprisoned in our bodies, and having been out of my body any number of times, uh, I can say that the world as it unfolds in that state is far richer and more complex and more subtle in its meanings than, than this world in the sense that in this world everything is absolutely fixed. A chair is a chair, a table is a table. But in that world, the, it is reflects what you expect it to be. And it takes a lot of discipline. This is another reason meditation is so important. Because it takes a meditative discipline to understand what is there. And listen closely, folks, because you're never going to hear this from anyone else. There's no one else doing this in this world now. Mm -hmm. There will be, there have been, and there will be in the future, hopefully. But to be able to take that consciousness outside of your body into this other level of reality and to become come into that same meditative state so that you have a chance of seeing objectively. All I can say is that time has no meaning. This world that we live in is a, a essentially artificial structure and it has a specific purpose. And outside of this world is something amazing beyond anything we could ever hope to imagine ancient and immeasurably conscious. Wow. Something that we were just talking about your newest book and something that I, I feel that people miss is the fact that you are a ridiculously rational person and you lay things out as they are rather than as they might be. And I just want to really highlight that to the listeners out there and 
mainly as regards your newest um, publication, that's the idea of um, phen- phenomenology. Sorry, phenomenology. And, yes, I knew I was going to trip yeah. over that. Um, but I graduated in philosophy, so I'm obviously going to be biased. But it's something I, I definitely read a lot about. And again, for those listening, it's a distinction between what is out there, in fact, what you know is the reality, and what you interpret it as so an experience in itself could be real could definitely have happened but the experience is not equivalent to necessarily the the actual object that is out there in reality as some people may say and anyway, I just wanted to highlight that, and I find it great that you and Kripal both address that. Well, I'm, what I'm interested in, under the circumstances, when so much is happening in my life that is so unknown, it's so unknown, yeah. I have, an, uh, it seems to me, an ethical and moral obligation to report it as mm-hmm. accurately mm-hmm. as I know how without drawing conclusions, because those are for later when we understand more. I am, I am going to transmit what I perceived without further comment. I'm not going to go beyond that. And uh, when I was first out with communion, I was driven crazy yeah. by the fact that the, the general media just went on and on with that. And they, to them, it was, a, it was aliens and that was all they cared about. And mm-hmm. it was such nonsense. Uh, who knows what it is and, uh, uh, what they are. Uh, and I, I just found it terribly awkward. Uh, to to deal with, and finally I sort of withdrew from public life. But things have changed in a particular way. I'm aware of the fact that there's noise being made uh, about the disclosure of certain things, uh, specifically that what are now called UAPs, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, that there's convincing evidence that they're under intelligent control. That disclosure could happen at some point in the future, in the near future, next year or two. And the reason I wrote Supernatural with Jeff, and we both wrote it for this reason, is so that the scientific and intellectual communities can find in the book a good intellectual ground for further speculation about this. Because what must not happen is for our best minds to jump to the conclusion that this is alien, is the, that the, it, the, the uh, documents that will be released uh, are accurately describing something when they say it's alien contact, because we still do not know the answer. Mm-hmm. And it's very important to start there, because the, behind the walls of classification, that question has been answered with a lot of assumptions. We need to take this outside of the classified level into the general world and especially into the best minds that we possess and let them explore it. And the supernatural is a place for them to begin. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I have a, I mean, a question as, as you were talking. It, it reminded me of something I've asked myself in the past. When we talk about disclosure and knowing, you know, the truth and when we go down that path, it almost sounds like here in the U.S., it's almost like the U.S. government has some kind of monopoly on the truth and we're waiting for them to reveal it. Uh, if this is happening all over the world, uh, are these entities or is this phenomenon not revealing itself to other governments that could then come forward and say, hey, you know, we got this type of thing happening when we can't explain it? Uh, or is this something unique to the country that we live in? No, it's not unique to this country. Other governments have already done that. The British government, uh, uh, British Ministry of Defense, declassified the Condon report, Condine report in uh, the year 2000, 15 years ago. But nobody noticed it. In fact, the report states, frankly, that these plasmas are unknown to science and that they do have an effect on the human mind. 
um, it do, it stops short of saying that they are intelligently guided, but the implication of that is overwhelming if you read the report. Uh, and so they did they, they did it. Uh, the French government has released everything I think that it possesses, and so has the Chilean government. The Brazilian government has a lot of material that it hasn't released, but it also has in one of its provinces a special police unit that does nothing but deal with this particular problem because it emerges so many, so much in that area. So this is, it's in a sense, it's old news, but we have to remember always that we don't know where any of this comes from. Correct. Uh, we, my uncle Mickey was uh, involved in the Roswell incident. Uh, he was one of the officers who examined the debris when it was brought to Wright Field to the Air Materiel Command in 1947. And he told me, he said, this material was extraordinary. We, we did not know how to handle it. We didn't even know what it was. And then a metallurgist called uh, Dr. Sauerbacher, some years later, told me that it had been, once they invented the, had the access to the electron microscope, they found that it was welded uniformly at the molecular level. Wow. That is futuristic as hell. We, we can't do that. And General Arthur Exxon, who was also a friend of my family, and had been involved in this in, at Wright Field as my uncle's commanding officer and was later commandant of, uh, of, uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base said to me, everyone from Truman on down knew that this was not of this world within 24 hours. What we'd found was not of this world within 24 hours of our finding it. But that still doesn't mean it was alien. It could mean anything. It could even mean that it was from another time. We wow. don't know. And I'll tell you frankly, I don't think we know to this day. I think if we looked at, were able to look at documents that were still classified and that are legally still classified, we might find out more of what the government knows. But the trouble with people who have to work behind the barrier of classification is it's a sealed room. You, there's not enough interaction with, with minds outside of that. And most Good scientists don't want to be back behind that door, behind that wall, because they can't publish and they can't make uh, they, they they can't make a, a a career for themselves. The last thing someone like Stephen Hawking would want would be for his work to be classified. It would be a disaster for him. So the result of this is that progress behind that wall is very slow. It's it, and and very uncertain and. The under the provisions of, of the National Security Act, the military cannot or material information cannot be released to the public of this kind unless it has been determined by the military that it has no national security significance, and they can't make that determination because they don't understand it. In February, John Podesta tweeted as he left the Obama administration that he, his greatest regret was that the UFO material had not yet been released. And he said, in terms of its release, he said, it's the law. And what he meant was two possibilities. One is that there's classified material that's more than 30 years old uh, that is that has been determined not to be of any military significance. In other words, it doesn't represent a threat that material should be released. It could be that there's other material, more recent material, that has also been determined to be about things that don't represent a threat. But that should not be classified. It's illegal to classify. However, parts of the military, most notably the United States Air Force, uh, have made a generations-long effort to deny this. And what happens to them when it is released and it turns out they were lying all along and and in addition say there is a release of such documents by Hillary Clinton if she's become, becomes president so okay. she said she would 
uh, and she releases the documents. And the documents say that some of the UAPs appear to be unequivocally under intelligent control and describe this belief in such a way that it becomes impossible to, to, to deny it. And we have to conclude they are under intelligent control. How long will it take the, the media before it asks the president, well, what about the abductions? Then what do they do? Right. What do they say? I know what they have to say. They have to say they don't know what's happening to people because they don't, in fact. You know, it's funny because it's something that I've, I've been keeping up a bit. There's uh, an author, and I believe you're familiar with him, is uh, uh, David Politis, who writes a lot about these disappearances. And a lot of people... Disappearances, yes, I know David, and he's been on my show. And I like his approach because it's similar to yours in the sense that he lays out the facts and he doesn't put labels on things. And when I read his books, you know, I couldn't just say, oh, it's aliens or, oh, it's the government. And to me, it felt like... It was a number of things that could possibly, yeah, be connected in some kind of, you know, if I may use the word, kind of supernatural level. And that's what I feel that you have done throughout your career putting these books out, is you're just putting your experiences on paper and not really saying, well, you know, it's this, that, or the other. Uh, because no. you, I mean, I think it's fair to say, and, and I don't mean no disrespect, but I feel to, to an extent you yourself don't know, correct? You're still trying to... That is correct. I'm not... I hold nothing back. I have not signed any any uh, secrecy agreements, or I don't, I don't have a security clearance. I'm not obligated to hold anything back, and I do not. In fact, I, I, I say everything. That's why, that's why I get in so much trouble <laughs> from the media, because I see... I say some... I say things that, 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 that don't fit the paradigm. Yeah, even within the, uh, you know, UFO circles or some of the paranormal circles, uh, uh, I, I can see how your, um, information can be, a, a, a somewhat of a, of a point of, of, uh, arguing. But. Oh, sure. They all do. The UFO people don't like, a lot of the UFO investigators don't like my, my stuff because I'm talking about things they don't want to hear. They want to think of it as aliens from another planet are coming here and studying us. Right. They don't want to hear that the aliens walked into somebody's uh, house with their dead son in tow, which happened. Uh, they don't want to hear things like that. Mm -hmm. They want, don't want to hear uh, things like the aliens cause people to move through time, which has happened also. Right. Uh, they don't want to hear a story about the aliens ending up in a tree in somebody's backyard. That happened, too. All of that stuff, they don't want that because it doesn't fit their beliefs. That's why Jeff says in Supernatural, make the cut. Let's cut make a cut right. between all of our unprovable and unproven beliefs and the phenomena. And just let's, mm -hmm. just, let's just get this described and then go from there. Right. Uh, when you talk about meditation and how this uh, allows you to, to experience a, um, a different reality, if I may use the term, what are your thoughts on what I feel? I mean, I wasn't around in, in the 60s, but, you know, I've read a lot of books and things, of, you know, about how, you know, the culture and the society in the 60s. And I... I can't help but seeing some parallels, one of them in, uh, being, you know, there seems to be this renewed interest on psychedelics, and a lot of people have been using psychedelics to enter these altered states, and, you know, you you can do a Google search, and there's, you know, tours of uh, Peru or Brazil where you can go have a whole experience with a shaman, etc. And yeah. here on the show with Genevieve, we kind of have this back and forth where we, f you know, uh, she feels that um, the meditation, the discipline of meditation, it's kind of like more of the proper way to go about this and not psychedelics. That's more like a hack or a shortcut. Uh, do you have any opinions on that? If, are psychedelics something that will take you to the same place or are there risks in doing that and it's better to form a discipline of meditation if this is something that one aspires to do? Well, I would not personally spend my money on them. Because obviously I don't need them. Um, uh, the I have a dear friend Graham Hancock who's very involved in ayahuasca and all of those things. Mm -hmm. He's tried them all, and he thinks they're they're a fundamental part 
of his spiritual life and his spiritual experience. And I, I would think, fine, if that's the way you want to go, go. Don't hesitate. Don't, don't, uh, you know, take it where you want to go. I, I don't think, um, it's not a, it's not a direction I'm going to go in, but, uh, that doesn't mean another person shouldn't do it. I mean, what if you've spent years of meditation and you're still at ground zero? All right. Seems like maybe trying ayahuasca would make some sense. Right. Why not? Right. I don't agree that it's, uh, those, those plants are there and they fit our different receptors in our brains too perfectly. I don't think that's necessarily an accident. And I think they may be there for this purpose, to help open these doors. And so I would say if you can't open a door and you've got a key that works in ayahuasca or EMT or something, use the key. Mm -hmm. Open the door. And what does that tell us about, and I know in, in your book, Supernatural, you talk about this, and it's really, really fascinating because it's, it's something that I've struggled with for, for a while now. It's like, what do we make of our brain? Is our brain, is our consciousness enclosed and limited to our brain function, or is our brain Mere, not merely, I'm not trying to downplay, <laughs> downplay the role of the brain, but is the brain more like an antenna or, or a receptor with which we, we interpret the, the world that we live in? I think the latter. Um, I'm not so, the life I've lived and the life I live now is so, uh, profoundly arrayed into other levels of reality that I can't say that my conscious lives only in my brain. I'm a person who's looked, been out of my body and looked at my body from the outside in perfectly normal consciousness. Wow. That's not, a, I mean, it's impossible for me to think that 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 was somehow or another didn't happen. It did happen. And all of the elegant theorizing about how that state can be induced, it can't be. I know a great deal about the efforts to induce that state and how they work, and a a, a, a simulation of it can be created using uh, electrodes on, on the head, mm -hmm. but the real experience, absolutely not. I went, I got out of my body, I moved out through uh through a wall and window into the front yard in my in, in my cabin and came back again and but I could not re-enter my body because I had probably because I'd been out too long and I kept falling out of it sliding out of it and slipping down kind of the side of the bed and I was really having trouble and I was thinking oh great now Anne's going to wake up and find a dead body beside her my poor wife I mean hasn't she been through enough what happened what happened was my father showed up. Wow. So I was in this world, but I was also in another world in which my father is still alive. And as it happened, he knew very well how to get me to run like hell. He was mowing the front lawn, which I did not like to do when I was a little more. I hated it. And he turns to me and he says, when are you going to come help me? And the answer was not soon. I was immediately back in my body. It didn't take a second. <laughs> so, wow. What I, you see what I'm saying here is that consciousness in my experience cannot simply be confined to the brain. It's not possible. I've been mm -hmm. out of my body in all kinds of different ways. And in recently, I've been moving into, in, in an effort to come, come into contact with my wife. I've been moving into the out-of-the-body state in all kinds of different ways and have succeeded on a number of occasions in doing that. So, no, we're bigger than that. Again, continuing with the with the brain and what what it could be capable of, I can't remember exactly, but, you know, some years ago, there was a book with a subsequent documentary that, that made the rounds quite a bit and a lot of people were excited about it. And it was The Secret. And, you know, they talked about how if you visualize something and uh, you can basically make it a, a reality. And not to not to 
cheapen anything that's in your in your latest book, but in your book you uh, you speculate that you know the belief can make real. I'll quote here briefly. Uh, it may even act as a psychic portal through which other beings can enter our world. Is our brain that powerful? It, it can our thoughts? A lot of people said, you know, Jesus was one of these people that, you know, he, he could just think something and make it happen. Is our brain that powerful or is it our conscious that makes it powerful and affects the reality of the world that we live in? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think anybody, and nobody I know does. Uh, however, I will say this about the secret. I mean, did it work for you? It didn't for me. I don't know anyone it did work for. Uh, because wishing does not necessarily make it true. Right. When there is some kind of a parallel between an, a hope or an expectation and the outside world, sometimes they come into sync with each other somehow. And there may be great masters, Jesus or others, who know how that works and can do it at will. Uh-huh. Uh, unfortunately, that's not my situation. I'd be, I'd be uh, winning a lottery a lot more. <laughs> Right, right. Well, the one thing I love about the way you write and explain things is that you really push your audience to think beyond, uh, you know, what we're experiencing right now. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of toying with this thought earlier in the day is that, you know, we have a million questions and I feel like humanity as a whole, it seems to be looking for one single answer. But even if that single answer exists, in your opinion, are we even capable of understanding it, or are we in a place in human history where we're equipped to handle that truth? And if not, in your opinion, as somebody that has experienced reality beyond what most of us ever will in our physical lifetime, what can we do to get to that point? Well, we are um, in a situation in this planet where we're going to be under an awful lot of of pressure from the environment. Some years ago, I wrote a book with Art Bell called Superstorm, which was based on something a man told me in 1999 in a hotel room in uh, Toronto, a very remarkable man who walked, got into the room in the middle of the night because I thought he was a room service waiter. And he turned out to be one of the most brilliant people I've ever talked to. And I don't know who he was. I didn't get an ID or a business card or anything to think to, and I never was able to find him again. I wrote a little book about him called The Key, which is a conversation with this man. And in it, he describes a certain set of circumstances that happen that cause a, a sudden climate change. Just a few days ago, one of the great leading climate change scientists in the world published a paper uh, in concert with a, with a number of other leading scientists stating essentially, without mentioning our book, obviously, or certainly not the key, that the superstorm scenario is real. He, it was exactly what he describes as the danger is exactly what the master of the key described. Oh, wow back in 19, all those years ago. And this means we're under pressure. We're in, we're at the edge of a vast change on the planet Earth. And all of this stuff that's happening to me that's floating around in the air is all the mind in and out of the brain trying to prepare itself to survive this, in my opinion. Wow. Wow. Um, I've had a few quotes that have kind of been keeping on hold here, but that I definitely want to mention before the end of the show. One of them is um, one that you have at the beginning of your book, Solving the Communion Enigma, What is to Come. And that was actually a Schopenhauer quote, which reads, All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, 
it is accepted as being self-evident. And um, it related very closely to a, a book I really love by a professor at my old uh, college. Um, he was called Dean Radin. And he had a, a Carl Jung quote at the beginning of one of his books. And I, I think that's also very pertinent to what we're talking about. The psyche's attachment to the brain, i.e. its space-time limitation, is no longer as self-evident and incontrovertible as we have hitherto been led to believe. It is not only permissible to doubt the absolute validity of space-time perception, it is, in view of the available facts, even imperative to do so. And sorry for that butting in, but I really felt that related to, you know, what, what you're coming forth with nowadays. Well, it is It is imperative to do so because... We are disempowering ourselves mm -hmm. by insisting that the, that there can be no consciousness outside of biological structure because we're not looking in the right place for help. What we need to do is to look toward mind unbound and from mind unbound we will find the innovations that we require to survive. Absolutely. That is the, in fact the truth. Yeah, and I have one question that I know you've been asked many times before, but <laughs> I want to ask it myself. What would you say to someone who has had similar experiences to yours, but hasn't as such, you know, come out yet about it and has possibly been scared to do so? Well, don't come out until later because it's, it's too fraught. Mm -hmm. There's too many things can go wrong. You can lose your job. I mean, people have had divorces. They've been in situations where their children have been awarded to the other parent because they came out with this mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. It's not generally accepted, and it can be used against you. And it's pitiful that that's the case, because if it wasn't the case, we would we would learn a great deal more about ourselves than we have. Mm -hmm. Uh Hopefully that will change, and if it does change, then do come out. But before that, I would be extremely careful to look at your life and and the world around you and the world you live in and the people you know and your loved ones and friends and your coworkers and bosses. And if all of that is fine, and you know for certain that none of those people will react badly, then you could come out. Otherwise, no. Now, I, I don't, I, I don't want to delve into this too far, too far but, um, but just briefly um, to just make briefly listeners aware to, of it, to make you listeners have aware of had, it, you uh, have an actually had put into an implant put into your Bible. left ear of the Bible. Yes, that's in my Bible. Yes. 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 The doctor did try to take and it out. They yes, the doctor did try to take it out. They managed to get a part of it, but unfortunately, the rest does remain in the ear. Okay, well, could you, okay. Well, could you, okay. okay. very briefly, well, could you, I, I know that's difficult, very but briefly, I know that's difficult, but a little about this and there's a little about this and it's still in your ear. I mean, I guess why it's still in your ear. It couldn't be removed because when the doctor opened an incision above it, it moved down into my earlobe away from his scalpel. Mm -hmm. He got a little piece of it. I remember when it was put in very well. I was awake when it happened. I just couldn't, I couldn't uh, resist the people who did it. It was done by people, not aliens. Yeah. And uh, they implanted it. They put it in my ear without opening an incision. There was no scar there. It was simply put in somehow through the skin. Uh, and they were not normal people, and they were not of this of this world as we know it. They may have been people in, involved in some very much higher technology, but they certainly weren't ordinary people. In any case, uh, the doctor sent uh, the little fragment he got out of it to pathology in the normal course of affairs, and the pathologist telephoned him and said, is this a joke? And he said, no, it's not a joke. And he said, because what you've sent me is a piece of technology of some kind. There's a, mm -hmm. a metal 
base, and there are cilia growing out of it, living cilia. They're moving. Wow, yeah. They're not dead. And uh, then a couple days later, the implant, which had been down in my earlobe, moved back up to the position it's in to this day. My wife, Anne, thought it, never thought it should be taken out. She was very against it. Mm-hmm. And uh, over the years, I gradually learned that it is not a tracking device. It is not something that listens to in or communicates about me in any way. It is rather a source of information for me and an, a way of, that enables me to remain conscious, fully conscious in my brain consciousness while perceiving other realities. That's, for example, I don't think I ever could have seen the master of the key and interacted with him the way I did without the object in my ear. It is both a machine and a living being. It is going to die with me and also live on wow. with the mechanical part of it. It is it is something truly extraordinary. And after I pass away, its remains will be dissected out of my ear, and whatever happens to them happens to them then. Wow. Well, we we hope that we can have you uh, a, a bit longer, that's for sure, Mr. Schreiber, because you definitely... Uh, give us some amazing, uh, really un- unparalleled insight into some of these unexplained uh, events that I think a lot of people experience, but you, you have a gift for uh, putting into words events that I think will leave many of us, including myself, speechless. The Supernatural, A New Vision of the Unexplained is the latest book by Mr. Whitley Strieber. Uh, Mr. Strieber, for the few that may not know, can you tell us uh, where people can find more about you and get your book and, and catch your uh, your show? Well, they should go to unknowncountry.com to listen to my show. And the, sh- the, the, the website has news every day. It has my journal, my wife's wonderful diary, Anne's diary, which is a beautiful thing, uh, is there. And uh, as I say, there's daily news. There's two weekly shows, three actually. One is The Experience with Jeremy Vaney, which comes on on Wednesdays. Nice. Then on Friday afternoon, uh, Dreamland comes up. And uh, there's also a show called Awakening, which is my ongoing experience of of other realities Mm -hmm. as far as getting supernatural is concerned it was sold very poorly into the stores very few stores have it you should get it online at barnes and noble or or uh amazon if you want a uh a hard copy or uh kobo or apple or barnes and noble or amazon if you want an electronic copy very nice. And, for and like but, I said, I, I honestly believe that this book is one of those things that will catch up in the academic world because I feel it, it's so... Ahead of its time, in a way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it really It addresses, is ahead of its time. And yes. if, if, the, if this disclosure process unfolds, then the book will come into its own. And if it doesn't, it won't. Yes, and yeah. it is academic enough to already be in those circles. So, yeah, I... I think it will catch on. And uh, real quick, before we forget, you're also going to be at Contact in the Desert this year, uh, correct? Happening June 3rd through yes. the 6th. So if anybody is going to be in the in the uh, California area, definitely we encourage people to, to go there. And Mr. Strieber will be there. And I believe you're going to be giving a lecture and a workshop, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Cool. So there's, uh, you know, there's a place that um, you can catch Mr. Strieber and uh, hear some of the the, the amazing uh, things he has to share in person. It'll be fascinating to say the least. Mr. Strieber, what can I say? Thank you so much for being with us tonight. This uh, this has been a real treat for us uh, to be able to discuss some of these topics with you tonight. It's it's been really amazing, and and uh, we thank you for really your bravery in. Uh, being so candid and honest with some of these accounts that you put forth. Thank you. 
Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you so much. And that was、uh, Mr. Whitley Strieber. I mean, what can I say? Fascinating, fascinating interview. It's、uh, it's been you know everything I hoped for. Definitely got got a chance to ask some of the the questions that I've had since I was a teenager. I would have had more questions. And、uh, yeah, no, definitely、uh, the show was way too short for、uh, for this、uh, interview. But like I said, check out his website. Check out his show. Check out this book. Honestly, if you want to be ahead of the curve. Get this book, the supernatural, a new vision of the unexplained. And、uh, honestly, I I encourage people to. I I believe it was two thousand and eleven or so, but j- just a few years within the last five years,、um, he did release the book solving the communion enigma, and it is again very analytical. It breaks it all down, and it's super interesting and has. Anecdotes that had up until then never been recounted before, and again, they are very、um, scary at times. I mean, things that allude to childhood abuse,、um, possible almost MK Ultra type of、uh, mind altering experiences. So, yeah, if you're interested in any of that, it seems a lot to swallow in one book, but there it is. So, check out.、Um, Yeah. Also, his latest books, including solving the communion enigma. Yeah. No. I mean, it, he's got a body of work that definitely,、uh, uh, like I said, a great resource to pick up、uh, any and all his books if possible. And like I said, it really gives you、uh, a lot of insight. And most importantly, I think that sometimes we become、um, or we find our comfort zone in some of these topics, and we stick to one idea that we feel explains it all. And it's almost a bit arrogant. I know I've done it before myself. It's almost arrogant to assume that you kind of got a handle. On some of these things, when in reality, the reality of it—not to sound redundant—it's <laughs> far more、um, mystifying than than what we could ever imagine. So, like I said, pick up the book. I have it right here in my hand: "The Supernatural: A New Vision of the Unexplained" by Willie Strieber. It's a fascinating, fascinating read. That being said, I think the show is all done. Do you want to have a little quote before the end? Please. It's the beginning of again this this guy I was talking about Professor Dean Radin.、Um, he's actually one of the only I'd say possibly the only guy at、um, Cambridge University where I studied that that has really spoken about this supernatural topic, right? Yeah. Anyway, so the he he wrote a super interesting book called The Conscious Universe, and the first paragraph here is very very similar to the quote that was. Mentioned a little earlier on, beginning of the solving the communion enigma, the Schopenhauer quote, right、okay. about the three stages of a, accepting a, a new weird belief, right?、Uh-huh. Anyway, so this parks to that. In science, the acceptance of new ideas follows a predictable four-stage sequence. In stage one, skeptics confidently proclaim that the idea is impossible because it violates the laws of science. This stage can last from years to centuries, depending on how much the idea challenges conventional wisdom. In stage two, skeptics reluctantly concede that the idea is possible, but it's not very interesting, and the claim effects are extremely weak. Stage three begins when the mainstream realizes that the idea is not only important, but its effects are much stronger and more pervasive than previously mentioned. Stage four is achieved when the same critics who used to disavow any interest in the idea begin to proclaim that they thought of it first. Eventually, no one remembers that the idea was once considered a dangerous heresy. That was that was quite deep. I don't. I, I, yeah, it's no, it's was... totally. I think it's、yeah. totally true. It's like、uh, things move. From literally, oh my goodness, this this is crazy. To oh yeah, but I knew that. And I, I, I knew that, and yeah, <laughs> it's very. <laughs> That's、true. what I said in the first place. Yep, <laughs> that's very true. And that being said, take care, be safe, God bless. Don't do anything too crazy. Want to see you back next week? Boy, this has been a, a whole lot of fun、uh, talking to Mr. Schreiber. Definitely, if you missed any part of this interview, check out the website wotrradio.com. We should have it up there in just a few days. And now. 
<laughs> we head off, and uh, honestly, I'm going to have a hard time uh, falling asleep because obviously my head is just full of put more questions. And, yeah, and I got to put that communion book upside down again. But uh, we're going to go out with uh, a little bit of... Uh, actually, this is one of my favorite songs, but it's actually a cover from the movie uh, Sucker Punch. This is a cover of White Rabbit. Enjoy this one, guys. We'll see you next week. Take care. Be safe. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. West of the Rockies with Frank the Engineer on the Independent FM, Los Angeles.